Christianity, it seems to me, is unique in this claim that the ordinary goal is to become God's friend. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. Christians often speak about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or knowing Jesus personally. But what does this actually mean? Is it possible? How do we go beyond just knowing about Jesus to knowing him? That's what we're talking about today, and we're doing so with Bishop Robert Barron, who joins us from our new Rochester studio. Bishop, good to be with you. Hey, Brandon, and it's gorgeous here in Rochester. You know, we're filming now early summer, and it's just amazing. You know, it seems like yesterday we were under mounds of snow and ice, and now it's like just gorgeous summer weather. The trees are blossoming, the birds are singing, so it's <laughs> lovely. I just walked right past the Mayo Clinic, you know, coming over to our studio today. Well, speaking of the changes of seasons there, you are just wrapping up a, a great liturgical season, liturgical period, oh, yeah. which is confirmation season for you. How did that go is your first one as an ordinary, correct? As an ordinary. Yeah. I, I you know, confirmed 15,000 kids in California. So I, <laughs> I've kind of got that ritual down, but it was my first time in this diocese. And I did most of the driving myself. So just went all over the place. Uh, you know, I love it. it. It's a little long. And by the end, you know, most bishops are a little bit worn out. In fact, yesterday I just dropped all my vestments off at the dry cleaner because they're all wrinkly and full of oil. And, you know, so, uh, but I, I love uh, confirmation season, and um, you know it's just an uplifting thing, and it's such a a great day for these kids, and it's a, a you know the inbreaking of the Holy Spirit. What's more important than that? I was thinking of you this past week, and our son Isaiah, our oldest son, was just confirmed, and before the confirmation mass, they do pictures with the bishop and the priest, and poor bishop has to stand up there for almost an hour oh, with like a hundred kids smiling, <laughs> and I remember you saying that you're. Your jaw becomes like physically tired after hours and hours of that. It's a bit easier here. There, there are fewer kids at the confirmations. In California, I'd have you know, 70, 80, 100 kids. And it, we did it, of course, after the ceremony. And uh, it is a little <laughs> it is a little exhausting. Yeah. Well, recording this in early June, which means you are about to depart for your next USCCB meeting, which is yeah. being held here in Orlando. What are you looking forward to right. with this upcoming meeting? Well, I'm you know chair of the committee on um, we call it Limb Fly Laity Marriage Family Life and Youth, and uh, I'll be talking twice to the uh, plenary session. Once about uh, a new document on persons with disabilities. Uh, the last one we wrote was about forty some years ago, so we're going to propose a new one. And then I'll be talking too about World Youth Day, which is coming up soon. And so our committee is kind of the the we're the point people for World Youth Day. Um, so we'll see what else is on the agenda, you know, but it's, it's always good to get together and see uh, the, the brother bishops. Let's turn to today's topic, which is knowing Jesus personally. And I want to begin with the, the 30,000 foot question, which is how does this make any sense at all? Um, I think a lot of people around the world, when they hear Christians saying, you know, I met with Jesus or Jesus told me this or that, or Jesus and I were together, they think that's just crazy that that's ludicrous. How could you mm -hmm. possibly have a relationship with a man who died 2,000 years ago? So let's start with that. How would you respond to that basic sort of objection? Well, the, the key, of course, is God. If God is outside of space and time, and if someone is united to God in some way, well, then they, to at least to a degree, can transcend space and time. And I'm talking first now rather generically. So we can talk about, I pray for the dead, or I, I pray to a saint who lived long, long, long ago— you could say the same thing. Well, isn't that kind of crazy? What do you mean you're, you're in a personal relationship with Augustine of, of Hippo? Well, yeah, in the measure that Augustine of Hippo is connected to God who transcends space and time. No, it's not ludicrous at all to say that. Now, take the next step. When talking about Jesus, we're not just talking about a saint. We're talking about the one who is in his own person, both divine and human, who is um, the God-man. And so the closeness of the humanity of Jesus to divinity is such that, yes, we can communicate with Jesus because he is God. His humanity is grounded in his divine person. So I, I would just maybe begin with the saints um, as a somewhat less dramatic example, or even someone in your family, Brandon, 
who's died, but you, you know, maintain a relationship with them of, of prayer and solidarity. Think of my own father. You know, I feel his presence um, strongly. I, I ask him to intercede for me all the time. Um, okay, I've got a personal relationship with him, though he died many years ago. But a fortiori with Jesus, who's the God-man. I think one of the keys often missed when when skeptics are trying to understand how this actually works is the key belief that Jesus is in, not dead, but is in fact alive. The saints are not dead, but are in fact alive. Yes, it'd be ludicrous to talk with people who had been dead. They couldn't communicate with you, but that's not what we believe. Now, skeptics might reject that, but I think they sure. could at least find it more coherent if they put those two facts together. Well, yeah, think of the biblical you know, claim that, that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so when that's said, I mean, those people lived <laughs> eons ago. Uh, their, their bones have long turned to dust. I mean, they're, from a worldly standpoint, as gone as they can be. But yet God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, nevertheless, in the measure that they're in God, are, are alive, and that I can be in relationship to them. It all depends on your belief in God. If there's no God, then all this talk is nonsense. If there is God, if God does exist, then this uh, talk becomes coherent. We often associate this type of language of knowing Jesus personally, having a personal relationship with Jesus, with evangelical Protestants, but yeah. should Catholics also embrace this concept? Do we find this in our own tradition? Yeah, we should indeed. But there's a key point there, namely, um, we would hold to this as a mediated relationship. So right now you're knowing me through my body. So it's through my gestures and my voice and my presence that you come to know me. Well, Jesus is known 2,000 years ago through the body that he had when he was walking, you know, the hills of Galilee. But now we say he has this uh, mystical body of the church. So he's known through his church. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do it to me. And so Christ is now present to us, but in his mystical body, the church. That means that our relationship to him is real and personal, but it's mediated. It's mediated through the church. What we resist in some of the evangelical language is a wedge that seems to be driven between this personal relationship and then there's the church over here, which is like, you know, a lot of, um, you know, bureaucratic uh, institutional reality and so on. No good and important, but, but the real thing is your personal relationship. We would say, no, it's through the saints and through the official teaching of the church and through the sacraments, above all through the Eucharist, through good preaching, through the church, we have this personal relationship with Jesus. So we just I think we're wary of a wedge that the evangelicals might drive between that relationship and the church. Why does it even matter whether we know Jesus personally? Why is it why is it not enough just to know him intellectually, morally, just to admire him, follow his teachings? Why do we need to know him at the personal level? Well, think of Jesus' own words. I no longer call you servants, but friends. Uh, that is the still breathtaking, ordinary goal of the Christian life. It's not simply to be an adept of God, a disciple, a follower, uh, someone who honors and worships God. I mean, all that is true of, of any religion. Christianity, it seems to me, is unique in this claim, that the ordinary goal is to become God's friend. Well, see, how is that possible? unless God makes himself through the humanity of Jesus so available to us that we can look him in the face, that we can look him in the eyes, that we can, you know, as, as St. John puts it in that gorgeous first epistle, you know, that what our eyes have seen, what we've looked upon, what our hands have touched, that's the word that we're talking about. So God wants to draw us into real friendship with him, and it happens through our intimacy with the humanity of Jesus. Think here of, of Paul's language of Christ is the icon of the invisible God. Well, God is invisible, yes, because God is the unconditioned source of existence. He doesn't appear in the realm of conditioned things. That's true. If, if something appears, well, then it's, it's a creaturely conditioned object. But God can make, as it were, an icon of himself. 
just as a, a, a beautiful icon of the Blessed Mother or of a saint, draws you into itself, into communion with the one whom it depicts, right? Well, in a very similar way, the humanity of Jesus, we would say, is an icon of the invisible God. It's the way, the means by which God has made himself um, available to us for the sake of real intimacy and real friendship. I know many people might wonder how a bishop personally relates to Jesus. So can you share a little bit about your own experience? What does your friendship with Jesus look like? What's that like? Well, I'll tell you, you know, this morning, um, well, just a couple hours before I came in here, I begin every day with a holy hour. And it's a privilege of mine as a bishop, I can have keep the Blessed Sacrament in my home. So I come out of my room and I just look down a corridor and we have a, a, a nice room at the end there that we've made into a chapel. And the Blessed Sacrament is there. Um, I think too, Brandon, a lot of times you know, I come back from an event or something or a trip and it might be late at night. I climb up those stairs, it's dark in the hallway. And, and before I go to my room, I can look to the left and I see the sanctuary lamp. And I realize, well, the Lord Jesus is here. He's personally, really, truly, and substantially present to me. So that relationship with the Blessed Sacrament, which I make very sacred every morning by my holy hour, that I, I do it not in the backyard or you know, downstairs, but I do it in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. That's an important part of my personal relationship. Obviously, as a priest, the Mass. You know, the Mass is the source and some of the Christian life. And as a priest, as a bishop, I have the privilege of, of presiding at Mass, celebrating the Mass, uh, confecting the Eucharist. In all those ways, there's a real intimacy with the Lord. Something else, and it's not just the Mass, but all the sacraments. As a priest, um, I operate in what we call persona Christi, in the very person of Christ. You know, Vatican II says that when a child is, is baptized, it's Christ who baptizes, right? When someone receives uh, the word of, of forgiveness, it's Christ who forgives. Well, it, it doesn't mean the, the priest is morally at the level of Christ. That's the mistake people make. Oh, what a weird kind of clericalism. You think you're as good as Jesus. Well, no, no, that's not it at all. It's the priest is operating in persona Christi. Um, Christ is using me instrumentally to do his own work so that my voice becomes a bearer of his voice, my hands a bearer of, of his hands. Um, that's very powerful, I can tell you now. That's uh, Speaking as a priest and as a bishop, that really, in a way, everything I do, whenever I, I preach or teach, um, I'm doing it not in my own name. I'm not sharing my private opinions about things, or I'm not inventing my own little religious gestures, but I'm operating in persona Christi, that to me is is very important for my my personal relationship with the Lord. Um, so those are a few those are a few things I'd say. I'd be curious to know whenever you're communing with Christ through prayer, whenever you're praying with Jesus, if you envision a particular image or face of Christ. I know for a lot of people, either they choose to or unconsciously they they project the face of one of the Jesuses in film, you know, the actors that have played Jesus, Jim Caviezel yeah. or Jonathan Rumi. Right. And I, I think the it's an attempt to make Jesus a real concrete person and not just an abstract force or thought. But what what is what's that like for you? Yeah, I mean I would say a couple of things about that. what's funny is uh I came to know both those those fellows when I was in California. Jim Caviezel was from my pastoral region. So I met him, was with him a number of times. And then Jonathan Rumi, I know very well. I mean, I count him really as a friend. And so, so it's a little hard for me to to summon that, even though I, I, I love you know both their depictions of the Lord, but to summon their face because I, I just know them, you know, um, in the ordinary way. Uh, here's what I'll say, though. Um, Cardinal George mentioned this to me one time, that when he was a young guy in the OMI order, he had a spiritual director who said, every year you should read not a book of Christology, I mean, that's fine, but, but you should read a book about the life of Jesus that engages your imagination around him. So we might think of Fulton Sheen's, you know, Life of Christ uh, or, or The Lord by um, Guardini or something like that. And I thought it was a very interesting insight because especially people like me or more intellectual types, sure, a book of Christology, you know, and the understanding the natures in person and okay, but a, a book that would would bring vividly before you 
maybe in like Newman's sense of, of real assent. You know, I can assent notionally to the concepts about Jesus, but now this particular Jesus that brings that figure before your mind's eye. Um, second observation is I tend to prefer when I'm praying an iconic image of Jesus, not a photographic one, if you know what I mean. Um, I have a, it's a beautiful icon that was given to me by the, um, the Orthodox Archbishop of Chicago when he came up here for a visit. I love it. And it's a, it's an iconic representation of Jesus. Now, why do I prefer that? Well, I, to me, it speaks of, of the kind of the dual nature that you get both the humanity of Jesus. There he is, you know, concretely represented. But at the same time, there's something always mystical about those iconic representations. It's not just, oh, there's like an ordinary photograph of somebody. It's a, it's a mystical picture that awakens your sense of, of the divinity of the Lord. So I tend to, I like icons. And when I pray in my Liturgy of the Hours, I have uh, cards and pictures. And um, I have uh, several of, of the Lord in there, kind of famous uh, port- portraits of him. Um, so yeah, I do that when I pray to instantiate my sense of Jesus. A couple weeks back during our discussion of the new TV show, Mrs. Davis, we mentioned... Yeah. One of the most intriguing elements of the show was its depiction of the mystical spousal relationship between Jesus and the protagonist, who was a nun, Sister Simone. Can you talk more about this type of intimate spiritual relationship? And is this type of heightened spiritual intimacy reserved for priests and religious, or is this something that lay people should aspire to as well? No, I think so. You know, and don't, the thing is, don't sexualize the imagery. You know, I, I, some of the mystics do that. Think of Bernard and, you know, John of the Cross and others, and they're, they're relying on the Song of Songs, you know, the, the love poem, and they see the soul in relation to Christ and all that. Think of Bernard, you know, you go from the kiss of the feet, which is penitence, the kiss of the hand, which is discipleship, and the kiss of the mouth, which is the intimacy of friendship. Now, I, I just would say don't sexualize that, but it's a way of just hinting at the intimacy we're meant to have with the Lord. Call it friendship, you know, friendship at a very a high, intense level, a sharing of mind and heart and will and purpose. And, you know, so I, I would I would do it that way. Um, again, the mystics, if you want to follow them down those paths, that that's fine. And I think some of them have this very heightened sense of of that intimacy. And they will reach for, indeed, sexual language. John of the Cross does that, you know, in his in his great poetry. I mean, fine, as far as it goes, as long as you, I think, don't hyper-literalize that language. But it's meant to signal this real intimacy that we're talking about. At lest Jesus become, as, as you suggest, either a distant historical figure or the embodiment of some, you know, abstract ideal, then Christianity has unraveled. Uh, it is a real friendship with him. In my experience, and at the risk of overgeneralizing here, I found that men often struggle more than women developing this type of intimate, personal relationship with Christ. I think a lot of men find it easy to see Christ as moral exemplar, brother, warrior, savior, whatever your image, but divine lover or close, intimate friend, we find that a little more challenging. So what advice would you give to men who want to grow closer to Jesus personally? Yeah, follow him, become his become his disciple, and then you'll find in time that that discipleship leads you to friendship because I no longer call you servants, mere slavish followers, but friends. So begin with discipleship, do what the Lord commands. Um don't ask a lot of questions. You're a, you're a good soldier and you're following the commands of your superior. So do it. And then you'll find in time that you're being drawn more and more into friendship. Um, He might test your discipleship. Every single mystic talks about that. He might withdraw from you some of the warm feelings you've had in discipleship, some of the positive feedback. He might make your discipleship an unpopular path to walk. In fact, I would say, Brandon, if he doesn't, something's the matter. You know, if if you just effortlessly follow the Lord and there's never been a time of trial, opposition, difficulty, I can almost guarantee you're not really following him. So start on that path and you'll find that he will draw you into friendship, into intimacy with him. You know, and it's like good friends 
aren't expecting an emotional high every time they get together. But good friends will say, look, I'm your friend in season and out. I'm, I'm your friend when things are going well, when they're going poorly. I'm your friend, uh, come what may. And, and that's what Christ wants with us. He wants us to be friends in that way with him. Have there been people in your life that you just sense beyond a shadow of a doubt, this person knows Jesus personally? Yeah. I, I can just know it by spending a minute with them. Can you maybe mention one or two of those people? I, I mentioned by name, but I, but what you're saying is is true. Uh, someone, you know, the, the cliche who knows about Jesus but doesn't know Jesus. I think you can tell that. You can tell it in in someone's preaching. It might be very brilliant preaching. Someone that knows a lot about him, uh, but doesn't know him. Um, but that's the mark of the saint. That's the mark of a saint that uh, is is a friend of the Lord. Um, and I think yes, you can tell. It it's the well, it's the fruits of the Holy Spirit. That's where you see it. Uh, people that radiate love and joy and patience and equanimity and all those things mentioned in Galatians 5. Um, someone that makes you feel more alive and makes you want to love the Lord more. That's someone that really has a relationship with, with Jesus. Um, yeah, so I think you can tell. As we wrap up here, I want to circle back to something you said earlier. You said for Catholics, we don't separate the personal relationship with Christ from the church. I want to ask specifically about the sacraments and how they come into play here. We don't only relate to Christ in times of personal prayer, but also and especially through the sacraments. Yeah. How does this work? Well, the sacraments are the way that Christ life enters into us, if I can put it that way. Um, he's the vine, we're the branches. We're not just disciples, we're, we're organisms that are living in him and through him, right? Well, how is that life communicated? Well, baptism is where the life of Christ is communicated. It's fed through the Eucharist. If you're not feeding the vine somehow, the, the branches, are, they're, they're going to die, so you need to be fed. Um, how is that life restored when it's lost? Well, that's the um, uh, Sacrament of Reconciliation. How is that life given vocational direction and purpose? Like, hey, where's that branch going? What's that branch meant to be? Well, now we got marriage and holy orders. Um, how is that life strengthened in us? Well, there's confirmation, et cetera, right? So the sacraments, think of them as, as life. It's the way the life of Christ is communicated to us. Um, that's why you know people that but especially Catholics who say, I don't know, Bishop, I'm just so lost and I feel my life doesn't mean anything and I don't know where I'm going. And you say, okay, well, um, you know, uh, do you go to Mass? No, nah, I haven't been to Mass in you know, 30 years. Or, well, do you go to confession? Nah, I was, when I was a kid, maybe. Um, well, duh. <laughs> you know, uh, the life in you is not being fed. The, the, so no wonder you're lost. No wonder you've, you've lost a sense of, of connection to the Lord. Um, take the time, as Merton said, that's kind of like a holy hour, but don't stray from the sacraments. That's where the life is found. Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. If you have something you'd like to ask Bishop Barron, send it in to us at the website askbishopbarron.com. Today we have a really interesting one. As you'll hear in this young man's question, uh, he lives in Israel, was raised Jewish, hmm. then became atheist, now is considering converting to Catholicism, and he wants some guidance from you, Bishop. Uh, so here's his question. Okay. Hey, Bishop Barron. My name is David, and I live in Israel. Firstly, I wanted to thank you for your work. It is due in large part to you that I am seriously considering converting to Catholicism. Hmm. I was raised Orthodox Jewish, but have been an atheist since my early 20s. Hmm. My question is, I'm going to be moving with my family to Nashville, Tennessee uh, this July, but I don't know how to go about picking a church. Do you have some things that I should look for in a church and maybe some things that would be worth avoiding? Thank you so much, hmm. and God bless you. Yeah, well, thank you for that question, and God bless you and, and, your, um, and your spiritual journey. Um, you know, look for a place where the Mass is celebrated uh, reverently, according to the Roman Rite, where the preaching is faithful to the, the doctrine of the Orthodox faith. Um, look for a place where the people seem to be alive. You know, if a parish is just people kind of going through the motions, is there a lot of life and activity in that place? Look for a place that has a lot of young people, a lot of young families. That, to me, is a sign of, of health. 
Um, but I would say the liturgy and the preaching and make sure that the the Orthodox Catholic faith is being um, uh, proclaimed uh, clearly. There's a lively sacramental life. Um, you know, those are some of the signs of, of vitality. Um, if you're hearing preaching that's that's more vacillating and, you know, more questions than answers and what do I know, if the liturgy is just kind of a rote uh, process, if it seems uh, like it's lacking in reverence, um, I would stay away from a place like that. Um, I know if you're brand new in the country, you might not know a lot of people yet, but you have to, you know, rely on people that you trust. Like, is there a place that they have found that is, uh, that really feeds their faith, um, you know, follow that instinct. But also, you know, have the um, flexibility to say, okay, I went to this parish, but it's this is not, I don't think, the best place for me. And there's another one I've heard about. Let me try that. Have a little flexibility. But I'd look for, you know, good preaching, a good liturgy, a fidelity to the Orthodox faith. Well, as we wrap up here, I want to share with everybody a new book coming out from Word on Fire. It just released. It is titled, Why They Follow, Lessons in Church Communication from That One Lost Sheep. And it's by Matthew Warner. Matt is one of the leading communication experts in the Catholic Church today. And this book is like a one-on-one masterclass with him. Americans are drifting away from the church in record numbers, and at the heart of this crisis, Matt claims, is a failure in communication. The gospel message simply hasn't got through. People don't know what it is that they're leaving. And so in this book, Matt, who is the founder and CEO of Flocknote, the popular email and texting tool used by thousands of parishes, he combines research, personal stories, and biblical wisdom to deliver a fresh and much-needed guide to bringing the lost sheep back into the fold. So again, it's called Why They Follow. If you work in ministry, you're a parish or diocesan leader, a school leader, you'll find a lot of rich advice in this book to help you out. Well, thanks so much for watching and listening, and we'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Mm-hmm.